by complicated sources. But as you can see, um, although the colors may be a little hard to tell on the screen, the largest box there is entirely wild duck. Um, so 70% of the tourists <coughs> only buy wild product, and 96% buy at least some of their sourcing from the wild. As mentioned when talking about CITES listing of gold and seal, it is the expect expected that gold and seal dealers be involved in the administration of monitoring the well-being of gold and seal. Ginseng requires the name and address of the digger, so what information are they collecting at the point of sale for gold and seal? And we see that it turns out it's not a lot. Only 65% of dealers are recording the name of the seller, and even less are recording addresses and whether the golden seal is wild or from cultivated sources. <clears throat> Once again, the idea of the CITES regulation was that those benefiting financially from golden seal trade can, should, and need to be involved in its management. So that begs the question, are dealers helping manage golden seal by self-restricting buying practices? Golden seal fruit matures in July, so waiting to, until after that point uh, to purchase would help promote digging practices that enable the plant to sexually reproduce. Well, fall was the most common response. Uh, unfortunately, over 25% of respondents will purchase golden seal whenever it's available, with over 35% reporting that they purchase it during the summer. So a couple of the key results that were significant um, there was significant variation in the percentage of ginseng dealers buying golden seal across the range. Additionally, many dealers were not reporting important data at the point of sale. And these concepts together that uh, indicate that estimating the sustainability of wild golden seal harvesting, state level monitoring may provide more insights than the current reporting mechanisms. So with that, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. And thank you. stakeholder perceptions around conservation. But before I begin, I know it's such a short amount of time, I wanted to make sure I mention uh, Pennsylvania's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. They're the agency that provided all the funding for this project, so without them, uh, it would not be possible, and I think their continued support has really helped with animal research in Pennsylvania. So Golden Seal is an herbaceous perennial plant native to forest lands of eastern North America. It gets its name from cup-like circular scars left behind from the previous year's stems that resemble a wax seal imprint on the golden colored rhizome. The roots and rhizomes are used primarily uh, for, as an antimicrobial and for digestive purposes. Historically, the Cherokee used it for dyspepsia as well as the tonic for inflammation. Um, and the Big Mac used it uh, topically for chapped and cut lips. Well, there's little evidence that harvesting from the wild uh, reduces populations in the long run. There's little doubt that uh, the majority of the supply comes from wild golden seal, and that's caused some concern over the long-term sustainability of the plant. As such, golden seal has a number of conservation designations across its range. For example, in Pennsylvania, it has a vulnerable designation, which is for plant species that are in danger of population decline within Pennsylvania because of their beauty, economic value, use as a cultivar, or other factors which indicate that persons may seek to remove these species from their habitat. <clears throat> However, in order to further understand the context of golden seal, we also need to briefly talk about this plant, American ginseng and how it's regulated as well as it makes uh, its appearance a few times throughout this presentation. So just very briefly, ginseng also has the vulnerable designation in Pennsylvania uh, due to heavy harvest pressure for a uh, high international demand for the wild product. Both these species, in addition to having the vulnerable designation in Pennsylvania, are listed in Appendix 2 
of the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, more commonly referred to simply as CITES. Any international trade of CITES listed species requires an export permit from the exporting country that makes a de uh, non detrimental finding, assuring that the export does not adversely affect the long term sustainability of wild populations. <clears throat> However, if we look at the specifics of management programs, we begin to see some really significant differences. CITES management for American ginseng requires heavy state participation in management of the species in the form of state coordinators, licensing programs, and harvesting restrictions. The figure on the right is the structure of the national management program for ginseng, and the point is not that you're able to read everything up in that figure, but rather to see that Everything that happens goes through state coordinating agencies and they play a vital role in managing the species. When we look at golden seal management and regulation, we see that all that golden seal requires is an export permit. This stands in con uh, stark contrast, but it's largely intentional. The American Ginseng Program has long suffered from a lack of funding to support the state requirements from the federal mandate. Um, so they were looking when Golden Seal was listed to manage things a little differently. As such, the state's role is undefined in the management of Golden Seal. Instead, the federal government looked to give dealers greater re responsibility in administering and monitoring their transactions. Just as a note, dealers are often small local aggregators that purchase Golden Seal um, and other medicinal plants from harvesters, who are often referred to as diggers in the trade, and dealers then sell larger quantities to either local aggregators or regional aggregators and herbal companies. So the idea was that those benefiting financially from the trade can, should, and need to participate in its management. In return, the dealers agreed to keep accurate records of gold and seal purchases and to maintain information on routes from wild to cultivated sources. Additionally, diggers give dealers their name, address, and names of the counties or states where the roots were dug. This gap in government involvement and expectation of dealer involvement leads to questions that are addressed today. Specifically, in ginseng buying practices are regulated by and monitored, but that information is not known for gold and seal. Are dealers participating in monitoring transactions, and is there any state level variation in the trade? As, long as, as well as what is the source of gold and seal in commerce? Is it coming from wild sources or is there some cultivation taking place? Similarly, the first question for the CITES regulation to be meaningful, dealers need to be committed to taking conservation measures to promote the long-term sustainability of the species. So are dealers self-restricting buying practices to promote the sustainability of the industry? Lastly, I was interested in whether or not there was concern over harvest pressure from across the range and perceptions around the need for gold and seal regulations to promote conservation. However, for the length of time of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on these first two categories, uh, but if there's time at the end, I'd be happy to answer any questions dealing with that third topic. <clears throat> In order to address these questions, I used a scientific mail survey. Uh, the survey was mailed to 378 dealers and herbal companies from across the Golden Seal's native range. There are no lists available for Golden Seal dealers like there is for ginseng, so it was an availability sampling in which the survey was mailed to all licensed ginseng dealers um, in states that have Golden Seal natively found. Um, participation was encouraged through a modified dealer method, method in which um, the survey was sent, followed by two reminders to please participate. So with that, we'll get into the results. The y-axis is just the number of survey responses, and the x-axis is the state. After the three stages of the survey, I had a total of 105 responses, representing a 28% response rate. 64% of those, or 64 of those respondents, purchased gold and sale. So due to the limited number of respondents, especially at some of those states more near the periphery of Golden Seal's native range, I did do some clustering for analysis. So accordingly, I put Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and West Virginia together as the core range, um, while the remainder were in the edge of range, with a few exceptions, 
such as you see Oregon and Texas in there, California, which were uh, large herbal companies that responded. The core range was identified and defined in a report by John and Curtis Lloyd in 1884. In addition to the writing, they included this map that you see up on the screen. Um, and their book is still widely used to define the range of gold and CO today. Lloyd wrote for the heavy shade, this is the territory over which the plant grows abundantly in its natural habitat. This section furnishes all the drug of commerce. In the lighter shade, he wrote, territory over which the plant can be found but not abundantly. In many parts of this section, the plant is red. And we, when we compare that to the current biota of North America map, you can see that it's a pretty good fit. In the biota of North America map, the light green represents counties in which there's an official record of gold and silver being present. The dark green represents states in which it is found. And the brown is states in which there's no official record. So when we divide the respondents using that criteria, we see that uh, in the core range, 82% of respondents purchase gold and silver. Well, significantly less of the respondents or ginseng dealers purchase gold and CO at the edge of the range at only 43%. When asked to check reasons why they do not purchase gold and CO, there was a noticeable difference in response between core and edge of range. In the core range, the two main reasons were they don't have a buyer to sell gold and CO2, and there is not enough profit to be made. And while there's less consensus at the edge of the range as to why uh, a dealer may not purchase gold and seal, the top two reasons were they have no interest in handling gold and seal, and they don't know anyone who digs in their area. So you can see that in the core range, the reasons are much more economic based, while at the edge of states, it's much more based on lack of availability. In addition, dealers that purchase gold and seal were asked how much they typically buy. In a, in a given year. In the graph, the y-axis represents the four categories they were presented with, um, and the x-axis is the percent of respondents. And as you can see, when purchasing, more than 50% of respondents buy over 100 pounds of gold and seal. However, there was a clear difference between the core and edge of the range. 64% of dealers in the core range purchased over 100 pounds in a given year, and many of them scribbled in the margins of the survey that it was often over 1,000 pounds. And only 16% of respondents at the edge of the range reached that point, with a vast majority purchasing less than 50 pounds. As a follow-up, dealers were asked how frequently they purchased gold and seal. Once again, in this figure, the y-axis is the percent of respondents, and then the x-axis is the frequency. And you can see that in addition to purchasing larger quantities, the core range dealers purchased at a greater frequency uh, than those at the edge of the range. And they were also asked a follow-up question about when was the last year that they purchased. And the edge of range actually overestimated for every year uh, purchasing is the majority of edge of respondents have purchased in the past year. <coughs> Demand for gold and seal would not be a conservation issue if harvesting was being met 